Hi. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to IAP Lecture 2. This is on digital signal processing. Uh, my name is Phoebe. I'm an MIT alum. Uh, I'm the one who's been sending you all the emails. I was class of 2020, um, MNG 2021. And digital signal processing is uh, kind of why I've ended up uh, coming into this job. I took 6003 my sophomore year and just kind of loved it and kept going down that, um, that path. So whilst I'm not going to be able to cover all the content of 003 in one hour's worth of slides, I'm hoping to be able to give you enough of an overview that you can maybe get excited about it, go take 003, or if you've seen this stuff before, it might be a good refresher. Lord knows I always have to um, refresh on all these concepts. So without any further ado, we're going to jump straight into digital signal processing. So DSP, it's an acronym, MIT, we love acronyms. We're going to look at it first of all, at what the signal part is, then the digital part, then the processing. And DSP is kind of cool because it's what allows us to take a signal in the real world and actually do things with it on a computer. So an analog signal, uh, a continuous signal in the real world is continuous. We can't store that on a computer. We need bits, we need integers, we need uh, sampled points. So this is how we turn a continuous signal into a list of integers that we can store on a computer and then do things with. So pretty important concept. Um, so first of all, what is a signal? So a signal, we can define it as information over a channel. And the kind of formal definition in signal processing is that a signal is a function that conveys information about a phenomenon. Phenom phenomenon, yeah. So this is an example. It is a function. This is actually an audio signal. Um, it looks kind of scary, but this is also a function that's conveying information over a signal. Um, smoke signals, it, it's kind of binary. Does the smoke exist or is it? does it not? The channel is kind of a visual channel. In diving, you do that to ask, are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Traffic signals, uh, this is again, conveying information about whether you can go or not through light signals. Then we get our more kind of what we're used to of thinking about as signals. So for example, an EKG, this is a 1D time varying electrical signal, um, an image, is also a signal. This is information over a channel, but this time, instead of a time si time dimension, we're actually, it's a two-dimensional spatial signal. So our axes are spatial axes, not time axes. Um, but the signal we're interested in as an audio technology company is an audio signal. And I'm just gonna very quickly check that this is still recording. We are still recording, great. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, so we're interested in audio signals and we talked a lot last time about how this is a pressure signal, but essentially if you're in the same room as me, I'm speaking, that information that I'm encoding in that signal is being transferred via a pressure signal to your ear, you receive it, you get the information back. And that's essentially all we want to do. We want to maintain information. It's a bit more complicated if you're listening to this virtually. So in that case, um, my voice is the information carrying signal is going through the air. It's reaching a microphone, a transducer. It's being turned into an electronic signal, uh, which is then being sent to some kind of processing up to a transmitter, an electromagnetic wave up to some satellite back down to you uh, through a receiver back into an electronic signal through some kind of speaker transducer to your ear. It's a bit more complicated. And a lot of this, we need a way to represent this signal and the information in this signal digitally so that we can process it through computers. Um, and if you think about it, that's kind of, if you think about the amount of technology we have nowadays that relies on this process, you can start to see why digital signal processing is a pretty fundamental concept in today's technology. Um, 
So in general, the term signal processing refers to the science of analyzing time-varying physical processes. I've always already kind of defined analog versus digital, but just to kind of really solidify it, analog is this continuous time signal and digital is our discretized, um, our discretized signal. And the types of processing that we do with each varies hugely and we'll start to see why digital signal processing allows us to do some really powerful things. So this is an example of an analog signal processing. We have this time varying voltage at the start. We do some processing through a series of hardware circuits and we get a different signal out at the end. This is an example of an early radio, a guitar amp, and we can really start to see the complexity build until we get something like this. So this is all just to turn one time varying signal process it into another. And you compare this to a few lines of code like this, where we are simply iterating over a list of integers and multiplying by a filter coefficient. And I don't know about you, but this is much more what I'd rather do. Um, and this is kind of the difference between analog signal processing, where you're transforming the whole continuous wave versus digital signal processing where we are just multiplying these integers, this list of integers that we have representing our signal by some kind of filter coefficients. Um, so this is the process. This is kind of a denoising. We have our unfiltered analog signal. We put it through an ADC, an analog digital converter to get a sample digitalized signal. We then process it. We get our digitally filtered signal and we take all of the advantages here of digital signal processing and the ease that we can see here. And then we turn it back into an analog signal. So the reason we turn it digital and then turn it back analog is to take advantage of all the processing power that a digital signal gives us. And obviously the ability to do it directly on a computer and in code. Um, so back to signals, back to this kind of splitting it up into DSP, we're going to just look at the fundamentals of what we call a signal. And the fundamental is a sine wave. We can represent any signal as the summation of sine waves of different frequencies. And so we can think of our sine wave as our primitive signal. Um, we define a sine wave as being, as having an amplitude. So this is the height of the sine wave. It has a period. So this is the time it takes for one cycle. And it has a frequency, which is the inverse of the period. And this is the number of cycles that happen in one second. And this frequency, we can also think of as determining the pitch. So when you hear a pure sine wave, it's just a single pure tone with no harmonics, no overtones. Um, and the frequency, the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. We also have this thing called phase. This is the offset of the signal. Um, this is important when we're thinking that a cosine is just a sine wave offset by pi by two, and we'll see that more later. Um, we also have this kind of feature taking advantage of the periodicness where we can actually represent our frequency as this angular frequency omega. Um, this is two pi f, so it's just a fraction of the full two pi circle. And so from now on, when you see omega, think that's the frequency, the angular frequency. Each of our signals also has an energy associated with it. And this is kind of a measure of how much of the signal is then landing on our ear. So volume, essentially. Um, this is the amplitude times the integral of the sine squared, um, the area under the curve. Cool, so we have these fundamental signals, these sinusoids, and we can also see them in the frequency domain. So this frequency um, plot is essentially saying that we have no frequency components at anything other than omega and minus omega. The reason it's minus omega is that sine is an even function. So sine of omega is equal to sine of minus omega. So we have both frequencies there. Um, my, a negative frequency might seem kind of counterintuitive, but this is our angular frequency. So it's just, um, since it's periodic, you can think of it as wrapping around. Um, cool. So. When we're saying we're thinking of this in the frequency domain, this is a function over frequency. So this is the amount of each sinusoid at that given frequency that is present in the signal. And we'll see more of this later. This is a theoretical signal. Um, I just heard something. I'm going to check very quickly on the meeting. 
stay in the cool. Okay, cool. Back to the lecture. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, this is very much a theoretical signal. We never see a pure sine wave in real life. We're much more used to seeing something like a real wave, like a guitar being a guitar string being plucked. And this will give us a frequency um, content that looks much messier. So here we can see that we have the fundamental frequency still. So this is probably kind of the pitch of the note. And we can see the overtones, but we also see all these other frequency contents. This means that we are essentially summing sine waves at all of these frequencies to create the audio wave that we hear when we pluck a guitar string. And this shape is what gives us the timbre. So we can also see this for like a flute or a trombone, that these different frequency spectrums um, kind of give us the differences in timbre between these instruments. Imagine what a like full orchestra might look like, right? And we plot these frequency, this frequency content, usually logarithmically, both logarithmically in frequency and in amplitude. Um, and this is just for ease of being able to see some of the nuances since we hear logarithmically. And so viewing it logarithmically gives us a better understanding of the actual content of the audio signal. Um, we already talked last lecture about the decibel. So this is a unit of measurement. It's 10 times the log of the power divided by some constant. There are different constants, gives you different types of decibel. But I also want to talk about this uh, other unit called the MEL. And this is another way of scaling that frequency axis that it is specifically targeted to um, show the features in an audio signal that are specific to human speech. So at GridSpace, we deal a lot in human speech. We want to see those features so that we can analyze them, so that we can uh, do things with them, feed them to a model. And so we use MEL spectrograms, um, which is this kind of a spectrogram, to really highlight the features specific to human speech. And it works as a filter bank uh, that kind of tries to mimic um, how we hear. So this is again the cochlear, it shows that we hear logarithmically. So the difference in uh, 200 hertz at the lower end of the frequency spectrum is gonna sound like a much greater difference in pitch to us than the same 200 hertz at the higher end of the frequency spectrum. Um, so I want to show a brief example of this. So this is uh, a guitar being plucked, and then this is someone saying the letter K. So let's start with the letter K. Um, if I actually change this spectrogram to be linear, we can see that we lose a lot of that information that we had, a lot of those kind of harmonic frequencies. It looks much better if we... Um, change this to be logarithmic, as we can see, we start to see some of these uh, differences. We start to see some of these overtones, but it's still kind of blurred when compared to how we would want to look at it as the MEL spectrogram. So if I change this to MEL, you can see that it just brings out a lot of those features much more clearly. So this is an example of why we want to use the MEL spectrogram for speech. Um, here again, we can see here, we have a harmonic owner of the tones in the spectrogram, but they're much clearer in the MEL spectrogram. Cool, so that gives us our, our signals. Um, the next thing we want to look at is how we digitize those. So we want to represent these analog continuous signals as a list of integers. And in order to do that, we need to sample our signals. So sampling theorem is one of kind of the main design choices. And one of the things that's going to really impact um, what that representation of the signal looks like in our computers. And that's really important because that's then what we're dealing with when we're doing processing, when we're training a model with this. Um, so getting this right is, is important. So an example is a weather station. Imagine we have temperature and this is varying over days so this might be kind of one day cycle but it's also varying seasonally and imagine that you sampled this only at noon every day you're not going to get any sense of the daily changes in temperature you're only going to get the seasonal trends 
the same if you sampled it at midnight except for now the average we're going to see is much lower. You're still gonna get the seasonal trends, but the average we're seeing is going to look very different to the time before. Um, if we were to sample at a non-periodic time, um, so slightly randomly and under sampling, we're not gonna see any of those trends. We're going to lose almost all of the information in the signal. And this is what we're really trying to avoid here. Um, so this is maybe a good example of how we should sample. And this kind of key principle is that we want to sample at a frequency that allows us to conserve the information in the signal and in our digital representation, in our sampled representation. Um, so this is kind of summarized as time quantization. So the idea that uh, we have to quantize our signal into the series of integers that are separated by our period of time and that we essentially lose all information that's between each of these spikes if there's any fluctuations. So we need to make sure that when we're sampling, we're sampling at a rate that's high enough that we actually capture the um, fluctuations and that we want to be able to capture. So when we're sampling, we use an analog digital converter. And this takes our continuous value and it outputs a single value at that point in time. So this is an analog digital converter. It's essentially to a reference voltage. It's a voltage divider. And at each point, it's just comparing our input voltage to that uh, divided reference and saying, is it bigger, essentially. So we take our analog digital converter, which you can think of as just getting the value at each of these points in time. Um, very quickly, just going to check once again on the meeting. Cool. We are still here. Um, and we essentially move this along our continuous wave and get a value at each point in time. However, a continuous value has infinite possibilities. And we can't represent that in a computer. We need each number to be represented as um, in, in bits. So for example, if we were to dedicate three bits to representing the signal, we get eight possible values. And this is what we call amplitude quantization. We have to essentially round up or down each continuous value that we take to the nearest kind of bit level that we can um, encode. And so if we were to only have two bits, we only have four possible values, we're going to lose a lot of information. Um, three bits is a bit better. As you can see here, this is a 32-bit float um, in Audacity. So this is allowing us to um, encode up to 2 to the 32, 2 to the power of 32 different numbers. And this is the sample bit depth. So now we have two kind of key ideas that when we're creating our sample digitized signal from our analog signal, we need to think about our bit quantization and our time quantization um, such that we maintain the information, enough of the information, enough of the information um, that we need to retain in order to then kind of reconstruct our analog signal at the end. So the other kind of key issue with the sampling rate is this thing called aliasing. So you can see at each of these kind of points, we are sampling um, at each of these blue dots. But this actually corresponds to multiple different frequencies of sine wave. So how do we know which frequency of sine wave actually we actually sampled? Um, the answer is we don't. We can't at this point. Uh, the way to fix this or to improve this would be to sample more frequently so that we can tell that this is not this. Um, but aliasing is going to happen regardless of how you sample. And this brings us to this guy called Nyquist, who came up with this great kind of theory, um, theorem, and you can kind of find the proof if you look. Uh, it basically says that in order to represent, um, in order to be able to deterministically state that this frequency exists, we need to be sampling at greater than twice the maximum frequency. So to kind of say that another way, if we want to be able to represent all frequencies up to say 20 kilohertz, because that's the um, highest frequency that humans are theoretically able to hear, 
then we need to be sampling at a sampling rate that's greater than two times that. So greater than 40 kilohertz. This is why CDs, um, if I go back here, we can see that this is mono at 400 and 4100, sorry, 44 kilohertz, essentially. This is our sampling rate. Um, CDs of 44.1 kilohertz. Essentially, the idea is that we are able to perfectly reconstruct all signals that humans are actually able to hear. Um, one of the kind of issues with this, though, is even if we don't care about those higher signals, higher frequencies, they still exist. And we need to actually remove them from our signal before we sample it. Um, so we do this using a low pass filter. This basically just we set a cutoff frequency. Uh, we keep everything below that cutoff frequency, but we want to attenuate. We want to remove all frequencies above that cutoff frequency um, so that they don't get aliased down to these lower frequencies and kind of muddy the frequency um, response of our signal. So this is called an anti-aliasing signal, an anti-aliasing filter for obvious reasons. Um, so our process now looks like this. We have an input analog signal. We put it through some kind of gain perhaps, so kind of amplify the signal. And then we put it through this low pass filter, which takes away those higher frequencies that we're not going to be able to accurately um, capture. We then put it through our analog to digital converter and we get our digital signal, which we then put through processing. So yay, we have our digitized signal and it's all ready for processing. So the next thing that we want to look at is the frequency domain. This is one of the most kind of fun parts of DSP, I'd say. Um, also one of the hardest to intuit when you first see it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about the fact that we can see any signal in the time domain, and that makes intuitive sense to us. You know, it's a time varying, it's a number that varies over time. But this exact same signal can be represented in the frequency domain with the exact, pretty much the same information. And this is basically saying how much of each sinusoid at each frequency exists. These are just two different lenses of looking at the same signal. Um, they show us different information about the content of the signal. And we can kind of see that here. So this is the FT, the Fourier transform. Uh, you've probably heard of the FFT is the kind of quintessential version of it. So this picture is pretty, pretty nice pretty neat. So we have our amplitude and we have our time axis and we have our lovely sinusoid just changing over time. We have two of these sinusoids at different frequencies and here in the time domain we see that when we add them we get this kind of skew-y wave. Great. But we can also look at this along this axis, the frequency axis. So this is basically showing how much of that sinusoid of that frequency exists, exists in the signal. Um, and this gives us a much better sense of the two different frequencies of these sine waves that we can't really see in the time domain. But it doesn't give us any sense of how this changes over time. Luckily, someone came up with a solution for this, and this is the spectrogram. So please ignore my um, horrible attempt at making these angles match. But this is kind of like looking at this diagram, but from above. Um, so each at each point in time, we take an FFT. So each point, this is basically stacks of these FFTs all in a line. And the darker the red, the higher the spike. Um, and we can kind of see how the frequency content changes over time. Um, so yeah, these are just like a series of FFTs all over time. And each of those FFTs is taken over a chunk of audio. And the size of that window is one of the kind of design decisions we might have when we're analyzing signals, um, along with the shape of the window that we're taking over that time. There's a lot of kind of nuances that go into that that we're not gonna get into, but um, it's just important to know that even this is kind of dependent on parameters that we choose. So here's an example of a signal in the spectrogram. So we can see how the frequency content is changing over time. And you can imagine this slices an FFT with each of these red lines being a spike. This is again, the mouse spectrogram again of our kind of speech. 
And now, math. We have done the pretty pictures, and the fact is that a lot of signal processing comes down to complex mathematics. Um, so get excited. We're going to have a look at some of that. So first of all, we've already said that we can represent any series, any arbitrarily complex audio signal as a summation of sine waves. And the reason we are able to do this is because the sine waves are actually create a basis. Um, and this is essentially saying that they are orthogonal. Two sine waves of different frequencies are orthogonal to each other. What this means, orthogonality, is that, for example, if we were on this map, we could be on Music Avenue and it would give us no information. Saying that I'm on Music Avenue tells you nothing about whether I'm on Paragraph Street or Main Street or Geometry Street. Similarly, being on Paragraph Street doesn't tell you what avenue I'm on. So these two dimensions are orthogonal because knowing information about one doesn't give you any information about the other. In the same way, knowing information about a sine wave at one frequency gives you no information about how much of a different one exists. Um, we formalize this mathematically by saying that two functions, the dot product of two functions, um, which is defined like this, is equal to zero is zero. So any two sine waves of uh, different frequencies, so here we have kind of M and N, these are and we're only going minus pi to pi because it's periodic. Um, you get the delta function of M, N. So this is basically saying it's zero everywhere except for where M equals N. So two sine waves of the same frequency are not orthogonal because they're the same. Um, but all different frequencies are orthogonal. And you can do a similar proof to cosine waves, comes out the same, and any sine and cosine are also going to be orthogonal. And so this allows us, again, to just construct our arbitrary signal, a series of sine waves, but multiplied by coefficients. And these are those Fourier coefficients. Ow. I don't know why I said ow, I didn't hit myself. Um, these are those Fourier coefficients that kind of get talked about. And so the Fourier transform is essentially us changing the way we represent the signal from a time domain, a number that varies over time, to a number changing over frequency. And those frequency coefficients are kind of how we're thinking of that. Um, so this is uh, a signal constructed of these cosines and sines, and with these coefficients that uh, kind of a changing, but the more prototypical way of representing this is actually as a complex number. This actually allows us to take advantage of a lot of just nice mathematics um, in complex algebra, but one of the main things about it is it allows us to take our phase component out into our constants. Um, so these kind of constants that we're multiplying by, it's pretty much the same as this that each of these signals now we're representing as e to the j omega t, and then our c's, our constants, are also complex, a e to the j theta. Um, and a to the e, e to the j theta, that phase component is pretty hard to uh, kind of reason about sometimes. Uh, we'll talk more about that, I believe, in the text-to-speech lecture, but yeah, it's a nice feature. So now that we've got our signals as complex, uh, these complex e to the j omega t, um, we can now write our kind of Fourier transform as this. So again, starting on this side, you can see it's the kind of summation over all values of frequency of the uh, signal times by its coefficient at that frequency. And we can do the inverse of that as well. So we can get our Fourier coefficients, our Fourier transform, out from our time domain signal. And this Fourier transform um, is, yeah, it's a famous thing. I imagine you've probably heard of it before today. So when we're doing this, we actually, uh, now we have another continuous signal. And one of the points of this whole thing was we didn't want a continuous signal. Continuous signals are really hard for computers to reason about. 
So we want to make this discrete. And the way we make this discrete is by um, taking advantage of this really useful kind of property of the Dirac delta, which is an impulse, so it's infinite at zero and zero everywhere else. And when you integrate it, it gets one. So the area under it at this kind of infinitely small spike is one. And then we can shift it along. And by shifting it along and then integrating it, um, we get this sifting property. So when you integrate the Dirac delta multiplied with a function, it is zero at um, all points except for the value of the shift, where it takes the value of the function at that point in the shift. And so if we actually then do this with a series of impulses and our um, Fourier series, we can turn our continuous time Fourier transform into a discrete version. So we get it as the sum over all n of x of n with our, um, our signal now with e to the minus jn omega. So this is now we have our discrete Fourier transform, the DFT. And the FFT is just a fast version of this. So it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Um, so it works in logarithmic time. It's a bit like quicksort. You can look into how it works, but it is perhaps the most famous algorithm in ever. I don't know. That seems like a big claim. It's a very famous one. Um, yeah. Cool. So any questions on that? It's a very brief overview of a very large topic. And I'm not expecting people to, if this is your first time seeing signal processing, I highly doubt uh, it's making intuitive sense yet. It usually takes a while for that. And then you usually have to revisit it. So any questions so far? Awesome. Cool. So now we're going to look a bit at information theory. Information theory is essentially was written apparently in this just one paper by this dude called Shannon. And as a result, there's a bunch of theories, which is Shannon double barreled with someone else's name. It's basically someone else did a theory based on Shannon's work. Shannon's paper had this thing called the channel model. And this is kind of the quintessential idea of information theory. It's if you take an information source, you put it through a transmitter, you add noise, you get it back, and then you look at what comes out the other end, um, how much of that signal at the other end is informative, and how much noise, how much is noise. So one thing we care about a lot at GridSpace, we work with audio and telephony, um, the signal to noise ratio. So how much of the signal that we've got at the end has been corrupted or has had noise added to it, um, and how much of it is actually the informative signal that we want. Um, the other kind of big concept in this paper is this idea of information entropy. So kind of picture it as like if uh, someone is playing an instrument and just knocking. Can I play this? I can kind of play this. If you know that uh, the music you're meant to be playing, you're only meant to play once every half a second, then, and you've only got one instrument, then the number of bits you need to kind of know that is nothing. You don't need any more information if that is assumed. But if suddenly, like, you now know that it could be either once or twice, you're going to need to encode that in, let's say, one bit that's, say, zero if it's one, one if it's twice. Um, if you start then adding two instruments, that's another piece of information that you then need to know. So this kind of is the idea of how many bits do you need to encode the information uh, required to completely describe the signal. Um, another kind of theory of this is Shannon-Hartley theorem. So this is for a signal and noise and a band-limited signal. Um, there's the sense of the maximum rate or the channel capacity being less than that. And we've already looked at kind of the Nyquist theorem. 
So this is the Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem kind of states as a whole that in the perfect world where you have none of the higher frequencies, as long as you sample at greater than twice the, or the um, maximum frequency, you will be able to perfectly capture your signal. And we kind of force this into being with our band limiting filter beforehand. We try and cut out as many of those higher frequencies. And then when we reconstruct, we also want to have another um, low pass filter to make sure that we're not creating phantom higher frequencies out the other side, um, such as this. This would be like an image, a phantom ghost signal. Cool. So that's one kind of side of processing. And then the other side of processing is kind of all these fun things we can do with our signals. So any filter is the sense that you put a signal in one end, you put it through a filter, and you get out something different. And the filter is the thing that just changes it. Um, Snapchat filters kind of, yeah, you're putting an image in, you're adding a filter, you're getting an image out. These are and some examples of analog filters. Pretty much all analog filters have some kind of feedback and look kind of complicated. Um, this is some idea of what you might do with like a guitar amp. You low pass, high pass filter, and then you amplify. And then this is kind of some, oopsies, some examples of digital fil filters. So these tend to look more complicated just because you can kind of do more with them, I guess. You can specify them in different ways. And one of the key ones is kind of this unit delay, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Um, but that's a very common kind of block with this Z in it. Z transforms. Um, so I kind of just wanted to give a sense of what the Z transform is in case you're taking other uh, digital signal processing classes or anything. So it's just essentially a transform where we're taking e to the j omega and calling it Z. And then we're writing everything as Z. And this has the really nice kind of property that we can represent our Fourier transform as a series of, as a polynomial. And by representing it as a polynomial, we can then reason a lot better about um, transfer functions and oscillate, oscillatory responses of these with poles and zeros. And I'm hand waving a lot of this because I'm not actually going to go into depth on poles and zeros. But this is mostly just to give some kind of motivation for why we want to add yet another form of notation to our already very notationally dense field. Um, so in this sense, this kind of z to the minus 1 is a time delay. And we can reason this by being z to the minus 1 is e to the minus j omega. And if you multiply that by your e to the minus j omega t signal, you're shifting it along by 1. Um, so this is an IIR filter. IIR is infinite impulse response. It just means that we have feedback. So our uh, our kind of output signal, y, is dependent both on our input signal and on the output um, at previous time steps. Uh, this is kind of in contrast to FIR filters, finite impulse response filters, which it's essentially just you don't do any of the feedback. It's only dependent on the input. And this is how that would look. Um, so just in general, having been able to represent our kind of Fourier transform in this way, we can also represent our filters like this. Um, these some pairs. So any filter is essentially you have an input signal, you have a filter specified by h of n, and this is our transfer function in the time domain. And then out the other end, you get your output y of n. Um, I know we there was talked a bit about how your ear has a transfer function, your head has a transfer function, and that's just because any signal kind of coming at you, it's going through some kind of physical distortion before it comes, before it reaches your like inner ear, for example. So you can write a transfer function for that. Um, when we're doing the calculations on this, we actually convolve the two, the two sequences. So it's a convolution of your transfer function 
with your input signal that gives you your output signal. Um, and convolution is essentially you're dragging the flipped version of one of your signals across the other one, and you're multiplying them at each point in time. So this gives us this kind of shape from dragging this triangle along this. Um, and convolution has this really nice property that in the uh, frequency domain, convolution is multiplication. So whilst convolution is like sometimes long and horrible to do, multiplication is pretty nice. I do it sometimes. Um, or usually I ask Python to do it, but that's okay. So in this sense, uh, we can get our transfer, our frequency domain of our output signal as the multiplication of the frequency domain, um, the DFT of our transfer function multiplied by the frequency domain representation of our input. And this also then allows us to write the transfer function as the frequency domain output over input. Um, so this is kind of a diagram of how you might reason about this. You take your time domain signal, you turn them both into your effort, you use FFT, you turn them both into the frequency domain representation, multiply them, and then you do the inverse FFT to get out what your output signal would be. Um, so coming back to the unit delay on this, uh, in this sense, our time delay transfer function is just the delta of n minus one. We want to pick the input signal at the time of n minus one. In the z domain, this is then this, and we can simply multiply it by our signal. Nice and easy. This is like a really comp, not, it's not really complicated, but it like is a more complicated example. I'm not really going to go through it. Um, you can look at it on the slides later. It's essentially giving an input signal of a series of deltas, and using a transfer, you can kind of see how it's pretty easy to get out your um, y of z from just multiplying your h of z and x of z. And it's just a multiplication of two polynomials. Um, cool. So the project for this week, you're going to be looking at similarity of signals. We talked about convolution. So you're dragging one across another. Um, another kind of form of dragging a signal across another is the cross correlation. And this is basically at each point in time a measure of how similar um, the two signals are to each other. So definitely something to look at. And this is just, we talked about how convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. This is, there's a bunch of other nice properties. Um, so these are just some of them. It's quite a common table to have handy, especially if you're taking a signal processing class, just having this like somewhere is useful. Um, cool. So any questions on that? Yes. So this transfer function thing, it's, does it actually work? Like, so if I'm talking to someone in another room, like, uh, the thing that they're hearing is always going to be gotten by involvement, involving its own transfer function. And it doesn't matter what I say, it's always going to be the same transfer function. For your, um, if you could perfectly kind of represent the transformation that your output signal goes through, then yes, essentially. Getting a transfer function for a room is something that people do. Um, like any kind of audio, uh, a lot of TV uh, audio companies actually kind of try to find the transfer function of a room or, um, binaural microphones, the transfer function of your ear. So yes, in theory, in practice, no. Um, but that's like most things. Uh, cool, so one of the just key things I want to now emphasize about this whole DSP thing um, is that a lot of it is design choices. And you will end up with a representation of a signal stored in a file and knowing what went into making that signal be uh, represented in that way is actually going to change a lot of what you do.
do with it, how you treat it. So in general, knowing what your sampling frequency is, knowing if you're looking at a spectrogram, windowing choices, this is kind of really important to just knowing what your signal has kind of been bruised and beaten around and what's happened to it in order to get it into this representation series of lists of integers um, that is meant to represent an analog signal. And I'd like to finish with a demo. It is 148, wow. Cool, um, in Audacity again. So just to kind of give a visual example of the uh, filters I've been talking about. So first of all, I'm just gonna kind of show a bit of the spectrum. Um, if I were to do the frequency analysis on this, you can see this spike at 210 hertz. So I'm gonna say that that's probably an A that the guitar is plucking. Um, and we can kind of view this on the log frequency, linear frequency. This is linear and log along the x-axis this time for the frequency, but um, cool. And then if I am to then add a, uh, add a filter to this, Audacity has like low pass filters, et cetera, built in, but one kind of fun thing you can do is just play around, um, I just flatten this, play around with the frequency response itself. So you can actually design your own filters visually, um, just this would be an example of with essentially just taking out the lower frequencies, allowing all the higher ones through. I wonder if I can play this. No one can hear that, I'm correct, right? Cool. It is. Yeah. OK. I'm not exactly sure how to make that um, audible, so I'm just going to suggest that you download Audacity and go and have a look at that. Um, but what we can see is its effect on the spectrogram. So you could see when I kind of clicked OK on that, um, a lot of the noise got taken out. So a lot of noise is low frequency noise. And if I go back to that, if I were to switch this around and maintain the lower frequencies and take out the higher frequencies, you can kind of play around with this. Um, you can kind of see it taking out those higher frequencies, keeping the lower ones. So these are just kind of some um, simple kind of graphic EQ filters and they're pretty easy to reason about, which is nice. Um, again, linear frequency versus log frequency. In general, things just tend to look better in log frequency. Cool. And you can also see its effect on the like time signal itself in terms of the amplitude. Um, if you're taking out a lot of the frequencies that make up most of the signal, you're going to uh, end up just reducing the amplitude of the signal a lot. Um, awesome. So that's kind of the end of this very, very quick overview of DSP. Um, does anyone have questions, thoughts? Yes. Um, so the question was, when do you want to use an FIR filter versus an IIR filter? Um, so FIR filters tend to be harder to design um, and less less stable, mm, more stable, because they don't depend on the output. Um, but an IIR filter is going to, because it has the feedback, so anytime you want that kind of feedback response, you're going to want to use an impulse an IIR filter. Um, yes. Why is most noise low frequency? Um, just good question. The log scale of it. 
on the long sphere. It, right. it looks bigger, but it also just is the fact that like higher frequencies in nature are just less common, I think. Like, general there, there's no noise generating process that goes up the infinite frequency they all have done out curves so if you look at physical processes that generate noise that's a big like robotic and comics most comics are from this jumps it's thermal electrical noise so it's basically thermal electrons that has a one order f distribution and a lot of other physical processes have either a linear distribution or a brownian distribution uh, so like out like a turbulent air um, noise on the ground in. And so there's really not many physical processes that they can watch in the frequency, right? Nice. Yeah. Um that is also though interesting in terms of the fact that a lot of those higher frequency in human speech, um, a lot of times the higher frequencies are what kind of give us a lot of the information. So the higher frequencies are used for like localizing things um partly just because they a higher frequency um diffracts differently around the ear and that's kind of you can localize using that um, but also in terms of intelligibility in terms of speech a lot of the consonants um because they're sharper sounds so if you were to look at it in the time domain um they're going to have a much a kind of sharp increase or something and that um that's a lot of that information is encoded in higher frequency sinusoids. So if you take out, if you were to do a high pass filter and I would kind of audibly show it on this, but if you were to do a high pass, a low pass filter on um, a consonant, take out the higher frequencies, it's going to lose some of that sharpness and you're going to lose intelligibility. Um, so it's something to really be aware of with uh, signal processing of speech. Um, yeah, interestingly, one of the other things that affects kind of intelligibility is phase, even though with something like a sine wave phase is not, doesn't really matter for a pure tone, uh, for anything where you've got, again, sharp differences, phase is going to, is going to matter. Any other questions? Cool. Well then. I have questions for you. Um, well, first of all, I have answers for you. So this is last time there were some kind of daily exercises. Um, so these are the solutions to these. So um, how loud would, a, how do I pronounce that? Vuvuzela, a vuvuzela, a vuvuzela, a vuvuzela. Oh my God. That's worse than phenomenon. Phenom phen never mind. Um, um, it produces 116 decibels at one meter. A soccer field away. Um, some calculations. Do you want to present these, or are they kind of an exercise to be read by the reader? Um, so. Assuming that a soccer field is about 100 meters uh, by 1 over r squared, 116 decibels minus the kind of decibel, uh, the power of that, gives you 116 decibels minus 40 decibels, so 76 decibels. Now, if there are 20,000 people in a stadium all playing vuvuzelas at that distance, um, it would be that 76 decibels plus 10 times the log base 10 of that 20,000, which would be 76 decibels plus 43 decibels, 119 decibels. Hearing loss occurs at 120 decibels. So what I'm hearing is that you'd be safe. <laughs> like, go away, go uh, go for it, play the Vizilas. Never mind. In the trenches of World War I, uh, German artillery could be heard more than 60 miles away, but not between 30 and 60. Why not? Uh, a thermal gradient causes distant sound to refract over a dead zone. What's a dead zone? Uh, just an area where the 
Oh, okay, yeah, the uh, area in which you couldn't hear. Um, voice consonants use the vocal folds. You can kind of hear that. So uh, sh the palato alveolar fricative, the voiced version is the zh, and you can kind of, yeah, zh, sh, put your fingers to your throat on that one. Cool. So hopefully uh, some people kind of got those right. Did anyone on the video chat uh, want to sound off on that? Anyone get it right? Nice. Um, cool. Exercises for next time. So let's say someone is whistling at a frequency of 16 kilohertz and you're recording them with a sampling rate of 20 kilohertz. What frequencies are you going to actually see? Um, what is that 16 kilohertz going to appear as? And then what sampling rate would you need to use to make sure that you can see those 16 kilohertz frequencies as 16 kilohertz? Um, and then for a signal y of n is x of n convolved with a transfer function at h of n. And we're going to say that this is 3 x of n plus 5 x n minus 1. Um, what is then h of n? And then what is the Z transform version of it? What is H of C? So these will be presented tomorrow, actually, since our next lecture is tomorrow. Um, same time, 1 p.m. And it is on ML and the JAPS library. And that will be presented by Uche. So get hyped. And thank you for joining. And for putting up with the uh, difference in technicals. You <laughs> wait, say it again.